Welcome to Unit 4. As you can see, it's entitled Polynomial and Rational Functions. Now, up to now, we've talked about polynomial and rational functions in a variety of ways. But in this unit, we're going to explore them more deeply. And we're going to ask some of the more important questions that we had to bypass previously. One of them is, how do you find the zeros of polynomials? We know how to do it for linear polynomials and for quadratic polynomials. And we can probably guess some other ways. And we might want to look at some pictures. But how do we do it in general? And is there anything that we can learn from the polynomials as they're given to us? We're going to look at that in this unit. We'll also be looking at a few more proofs. So when I give you a result, very often I'll show you why it's true, as well as showing you that it is true. And with that, I think we'll go ahead and get started. We'll begin this unit with the simplest of the polynomial functions. Degree 2, the quadratic functions. We've talked a lot about them in the past, but there's more to learn, and you'll see it in this unit. So let's start off with quadratic functions. And oh, by the way, I've talked about linear functions before. They are equations. They are functions whose graphs are lines, and that's the reason I'm not discussing them now. All right, let me go ahead and define. You already know what this is, I think, but I'll go ahead and make a proper definition anyway. A quadratic function. Now remember, this is different from a quadratic equation or a quadratic expression. Quadratic function has, once again, standard form, always standard form, f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Now, this is not the only standard form, but we'll go ahead and start with this one, where, of course, a is not 0, otherwise it wouldn't be a quadratic. And a, b, and c are real numbers, as always. And since we're talking about a function, the domain of this function, domain of f, is all the real numbers. Any real number can be put into this quadratic and produce a range element. Okay, so there's the definition of a quadratic function. And this is very familiar, something we've talked about before. Now I'm going to start telling you some things that are not familiar. First of all, I'm going to show you a couple of other ways that a quadratic function can be written. And then later on, we'll find even more. This way, frankly, is not very enlightening. There's no structure involved, and we'd like to see some structure. Also, the letters a, b, and c are hard to generalize when we go to higher than quadratic functions, higher degree functions like cubics and, and degree 4 and degree 5 and degree 6, et cetera. So with that in mind, let me go ahead and give you a more general notation before we get any further along. We'll stick to the old notation with the a, b, and c whenever we deal with quadratics, just because that makes things simpler. But please realize that you can generalize it this way. f of x can be written, say, as a sub 2 x squared plus a sub 1 x plus a sub 0, where I'm using the letter a with a subscript that tells me which power of x it belongs to. a sub 2 is the number that belongs to the squared power. a sub 1 is the coefficient of the x power, and a sub 0 is the constant term. There's another way to write this. Factor out the initial or leading coefficient a sub 2, and you will get what's left over, x squared plus a1 over a2x plus a0, or a0, over a2. Now this, it turns out, is a very handy form. And we will talk about that later and see just why it's handy. And all I've done is factor out the initial leading coefficient. What this does is it makes this uh, quadratic function in here a quadratic where the leading term, the x squared, has coefficient 1, which makes a certain kind of calculation later easier. Now, as always in all of this, just to remind you once again, a2 is not 0. Otherwise, it's not a quadratic. And of course, that makes this possible, this division possible. And all the numbers a2, a1, a sub 0 are real numbers, just as they were on the other page. So I really haven't introduced anything that's substantially new. It's just a new notation. And this idea will be a handy factorization later. Now, 
let me go ahead and show you a theorem. And a fact about polynomials, in this case quadratics, but it'll extend to other polynomials later, that you might not know. Remember, in this section, we're going to explore the whole idea of polynomial functions a little more deeply. And this is the beginning of that, sort of the tip of the iceberg, if you like. If we have a quadratic, and I'll use the old form of the letters, a x squared plus bx plus c, because that's convenient, where, as usual, just to get it down here, a is not 0, and a, b, and c are real numbers. And I'm going to use some other letters here. r sub 1 and r sub 2 are its zeros. Remember, it has two zeros, possibly repeated. The r1 and the r2 may be the same, but in general, they'll be different. And we'll let r1 and r2 just stand for the two zeros. Then, this is a very interesting fact, that f of x can be written in a way alternate to this. Now, this will give it a certain amount of structure. It can be written as a, that's that leading coefficient I pulled out, times x minus r1 times x minus r2. In other words, this quadratic factors into linear factors, a pair of linear factors. And that is sort of as far as you can go. These are like the atoms for polynomials. Remember when we talked about numbers, we had something called the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, which said, if you recall, that things like 12 could be written as 2 squared times 3 if you go down to prime numbers. And the prime numbers 2 and 3 here, I thought of as atoms, which allow you to recombine into numbers like 12 and all the other uh, natural numbers. For polynomials, like ax squared plus bx plus c, the same kind of thing apparently holds, at least for quadratics. We don't know yet whether it works for higher degrees, but certainly for here it looks like if you take the roots or the zeros and you write uh, linear factors like this and multiply out front by the leading coefficient, you have a new way of writing down f. Now this is one of those results that I think is important enough that I'm going to prove to you because you know how to get these zeros you have a quadratic formula. So with that information, we can prove that this is true. So let me walk you through the proof here, and then I'll show you the theorem one last time at the end. Here is the proof. And during this proof, because I don't have a lot of room on this pad, and to make the calculation look simpler, here's what I'm going to do. Temporarily, I'll change back in a minute, temporarily let d which stands for discriminant. Let d be that complicated discriminant, b squared minus 4ac. Now, that will just make my work seem a little simpler. Now, the zeros of f of x are, well, we know how to get the zeros. It's just from the quadratic formula. r sub 1 would be, say, minus b plus the square root of that discriminant over 2a. And I'm going to rewrite that as minus b over 2a, writing this into two different fractions, plus the square root of d over 2a. Okay? And the second one, r sub 2, so that's r1 and r2. And the 1 and 2 don't mean anything here. They're just to indicate the two different roots. Minus b minus the square root of d all over 2a. And again, I will break this into two pieces minus b over 2a minus the square root of d over 2a. You'll see why I'm doing that in a moment. So there are the two zeros. And now the claim is that I can write down the polynomial as a times two linear factors in which these zeros occur. So what I'll do now is I'll say a times x minus r1 times x minus r2 equals, and I hope that at the end of this, perhaps on another page, I will end up with the original polynomial ax squared plus bx plus c. Then I will have succeeded in showing that this and that polynomial are indeed the same thing. And so that polynomial can be factored this way. So I'll put the a here. Now I know what r1 and r2 are from the previous page, so let me copy them here. a times x minus, here's r1 minus b over 2a, 
plus the square root of d over 2a in the brackets there times x minus, and here is r2, minus b over 2a, and here's a minus this time, square root of d over 2a. So now I've just substituted in for r1 and r2. Now, watch what I do. I'm going to run the minus sign here throughout, same thing here, and then I'll simplify the inside a bit. a times x minus a minus b over 2a is x plus b over 2a. And I'm going to put that in its own bracket like that. Then the minus goes through here and puts a minus in front of square root of d over 2a. So I now have a thing minus square root of d over 2a times the same thing here, x minus a minus b over 2a. I will put as x plus b over 2a. And the minus, when it runs through this time, hits another minus. So it's plus now square root of d over 2a. Now, if you think about the algebra you know, and you ignore the complications here, you see that you have an object minus another object, and then that same object plus that other object. Well, when you have two binomials like that, that means that is the factorization for the difference of two squares. So now I have a times x plus b over 2a quantity squared minus square root of d over 2a, also quantity squared. Okay? The difference of 2 and the, the sum of 2, when multiplied together, together give you this squared minus the second one squared. Okay? Well, let's go ahead and work some of that out. x plus b over 2a squared is easy to do. That's x squared plus 2 times b over 2a times x plus b squared over 4a squared, that's the b over 2a squared, minus d, square root of d squared is just d, 2a squared is 4a squared. And now I'm going to remember what d is. d, remember, is b squared minus 4ac. You box that in down here, and now I'm going to substitute it in. And since there's a minus out front here, the minus in front of the d will be minus b squared plus 4ac. And that will take me to the next page. OK. This now equals a times x squared plus b over ax. If I bring back the last part, you see that I had b over 2a times 2, so the 2's can cancel. And then I'll make this substitution up here for d. So this will be plus. There were two fractions there. I can put them over the same denominator, 4a squared. I have b squared minus b squared plus 4ac. Well, all of this is simplifying rapidly now. a times x squared plus b over ax plus b squared minus b squared. They are gone. 4a can uh, cancels with 4a down here. That leaves a single A on the bottom and leaves C on the top, so I have C over A. And then finally running the A through, I have A x squared plus B x plus C, and that was as desired. That's what I was trying to prove. Remember, I was trying to prove that that original, I'll bring the original theorem up now. There's the original theorem. I wanted to show that the original expression of the function is the same as this new expression as a times these two linear factors. And I started with this one, and I just finished ending up with this one. So I have proven that they are, in fact, the same. Now, let me go ahead and verify this for you by showing you an example with a uh, simple quadratic. Okay. Here's an example. We'll call this a verification of the theorem. I will verify that what I said there actually happens. And we'll do it for this polynomial, this quadratic, 3x squared plus x minus 2. Okay. Well, to do, to do the comparison, I need to know what the roots are, what the zeros are. So let me do that work first. 
First, I'll do b squared minus 4ac to make my calculations easy. So that'll be 1 minus 4 times 3 times a minus 2. That's going to be 1 plus 24, which is 25. That's good. And then x will be minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. That's minus 1 plus or minus the square root now of 25. That's where I get to use the 25. All over 2 times a, a is 3, so that's 6. So I have minus 1 plus or minus 5 over 6. There are two possibilities there. This is equal to minus 1 plus 5 over 6, which is 4 over 6, which of course reduces to 2 thirds. So there's one root. If you like, we can call this one R1. Or this equals minus 1 minus 5 over 6. Well, that's minus 6 over 6. That becomes minus 1. And if you like, we can call this one R2. How you label them doesn't make any difference. OK. Now that I have the roots and I have the original function up here, I would like to show that this quadratic can be written as the theorem says. So just like in the theorem, a times x minus r1 times x minus r2. I hope that that ends up being the same as this. Well, let's substitute and find out. a is 3. x minus r1 is 2 thirds. x minus r2 is minus a minus 1. So that's x plus 1. Well, if I run the 3 through the first binomial, to make it simpler and get rid of the fraction, I get 3x minus 2 times x plus 1. If I then multiply that out in the usual fashion, 3x times these two and then the minus 2 times each, I will have 3x squared plus 3x minus 2x minus 2. And then a final combination of the 3x and minus 2x gives me 3x squared plus x minus 2. And that is what I hoped to end up with, because that is the original function. So I verified the fact that if you take 3, the a, times x minus the first r1, times x minus the second r2, I do indeed get the original polynomial. Now this is one of those facts that will turn, up to be, uh, turn out to be quite useful as we go further on in the course. Uh, definition now. We'll use this definition a few segments down the line. f of x, which we can write as ax squared plus bx plus c. And we can also write as a times x minus r1 times x minus r2, based on the previous theorem. And I will assume that the a, b, and c are as they are supposed to be. I won't write that out. Such a quadratic is called irreducible over the real numbers r. So that's irreducible, meaning not reducible, if when you do this factorization or when you just compute the roots here, the r1 root and the r2 root, if r1 and r2 are complex numbers, actually to be more specific, perhaps I ought to call them imaginary numbers. And another way to say this, in other words, when, well, when do you get complex roots? When the discriminant b squared minus 4ac is less than 0. So irreducible over r. A quadratic is irreducible over r if the only way it can be factored is to involve complex numbers. If you want to stay solely in the real numbers, a quadratic that is irreducible over r cannot be factored any further. It is down to the, the smallest uh, po degree polynomial that it can be factored into, which is itself. So that's what irreducible over r means. We want to have many of our problems 
involve only real numbers. So quadratics cannot be factored into uh, real number factors if, of course, their roots are complex. Now this idea is going to turn up later. But until that time, let's take a break and come back and talk about graphing quadratic functions. Having looked at degree two quadratic functions, it's now time to look at graphing quadratic functions. So that's exactly what we'll do next. So let's go ahead and recall first what you know about quadratic functions. Right back to the library of functions, which we looked at under the uh, function uh, unit. And the very first one we saw was f of x equals x squared. Now that's the simplest possible quadratic, OK? This is the simplest, and you might call it the core quadratic function. You can't get any easier than this one. And we already know what it looks like. Its graph is what's called a parabola. Okay, so we now have that word. And if you recall, it looks like this. Here's our axis system with x and y. And the graph of this x squared curve looks something like that. This is the f of x equals x squared curve. It touches down here at the origin. That's the point 0, 0. And this point down here we'll give a name to. We'll call this a vertex. Okay, This is the vertex of the parabola. Or if you like, its nose being pressed down to the origin. You also notice in this version of the parabola that this is the minimum point. It is the lowest point of the curve. Now later we'll see other sorts of quadratic functions where the parabola is the other way so that the vertex may not be the minimum point, it may be the maximum point. But in this one it's the minimum point and that was the function we've already seen. So this is just reminding you of an easy past. Now we're going to work our way upwards. The first thing we'll do is multiply x squared by a constant and see what that does to the curve. And then we'll start adding in all the other pieces that might lead to the general quadratic and see what we can say about that. So. The first thing we'll look at, as I said, is we'll look at f of x equals ax squared. And the only thing I'm going to assume here is that a is not 0. Otherwise, we don't have a quadratic, as usual. If a is not 0, the first thing I want to observe is simply its plus or minus sign and what that tells me about the graph. Well, if you remember what we did back in the functions unit, there was something that said if you multiply by a negative number, you'll have a reflection across the x-axis, and that's exactly what happens here. Reflection across the x-axis. So if you have x greater than, or a greater than 0, then the kind of picture that you get as the a varies through various positive numbers, you know what it looks like if a is 1, then that's simply the f of x equals x squared curve, and it looks roughly like this. Now, as the a changes, the curve will remain above the x-axis, but it may become narrower. We'll find out later as the a gets bigger. It may become shallower as the a gets smaller. And there are an infinite number of possibilities in here on both sides. But if the a is positive, you're guaranteed that this will be up. Likewise, if the a is negative, as you might guess, whoops, Make sure I get it going the other way. If A is negative, then the picture looks like this, exactly the opposite. All of the graphs, with X and Y axes marked, all of the graphs, whether narrow or wide, or any of the many in-between graphs, will be facing downward. So this is an opening down parabola. This one was opening up. So that is entirely determined by what the plus or minus sign of A is. If A is positive, it opens up. If A is negative, it opens down. And later we'll put this all into a summary when we start talking about quadratics. OK, now let's worry about what the actual value of A is and how that affects it. I said something about narrower and wider. Let me go ahead and make that a little bit more clear here. 
Again, this is f of x equals ax squared. That's the general case we're looking at at this point. And now we'll examine what happens when you modify the value of the absolute value of a. Now that says look at a without worrying about its plus or minus sign. So the actual size of the number there. And by looking at that, let me go ahead and draw a nice picture here. This is going to be an A axis, OK? This is the axis for A. And I just want to see what happens as A varies, what happens to the graph of the parabola. So let me run a line down the center, because it's 0, of course. If A is 0, there's no quadratic to speak of. There's no x power to the power 2. All right, let's remind you of what we just did. We found out that the curve, the parabola, faces downward if A is less than 0. And here I am, less than 0. So in this entire reg region, the curve faces downward. It may be one of these curves that strikes the x-axis twice, or it may strike the x-axis once, or it may miss the x-axis. But it's definitely going to be facing downward. Then we know that it faces upward if A is positive greater than 0. Now this is all from the previous page. And in this case, it will be crossing the axis here uh, one, uh, twice or once or not at all. OK, now what happens as the A value moves farther away from 0 or moves closer in towards 0? Well, if it moves farther away, that's going to make the curve narrower. So narrower as the absolute value of A grows to infinity. So that means we have this sort of a picture. It's narrower as you move away from 0. And also, it's going to be narrower going the other way, which is just another way that the absolute value of A can go to infinity. So as the absolute value of A grows, which means the absolute value of A gets farther and farther from the origin, the parabola will get narrower and narrower. As you move closer into 0, as the absolute value of A approaches 0 from the left, say, it gets wider or shallower, I think I said on the previous page. So you'll have a picture that indicates that. And on this side, as the absolute value of A approaches 0, again, it's getting wider. So as the A gets smaller, you get a wider and wider parabola. So the picture for the narrower ones are going to be parabolas that are very, very narrow like that. The wider ones are parabolas that, that, that are sha shallow or wider. So that's what happens as the value of a, which is the coefficient <laughs> OK. Well, now we want to move up beyond just having a times x squared. We want to know about the other terms that might occur and how they will affect it. So now that we've looked at that case, we can now go ahead, take f of x equals ax squared, and worry about what happens when you do shifts. Now shifts, as you recall, were vertical and horizontal shifts that we looked at. Now let's see exactly what will happen here. In order for, for us to see this, I'm going to do a little derivation. Derivation. And this will lead us to another standard form. Another standard form. Now, what was the first standard form that we've had? Well, I'm moving from ax squared up to the more complicated case, which is the general case, ax squared plus bx plus c. Now, that's our first standard form that we saw earlier. Now I'm going to show you another standard form that will reflect the shifts that occur, that are occurring here, that, but we can't see. So in order to do that, I'm going to need to complete the square. We've done this before. Let me walk you through it. Factor out the a. Then we'll have x squared plus b over a x. Leave a space and put c over here. Now in here and then over here, I will need to add particular numbers so I don't change the equation. Here I want to add. 1 half of b over a, the coefficient of x, quantity squared. So that's what I'm adding in here. And then in order not to change the side of the equation, I have to subtract out what I added. Now this was added in here, but it's also multiplied by a. 
So when I subtract away, I have to subtract away a times 1 half b over a squared, if I can squeeze it in there. Then putting all of that together will make this first part here a perfect square by design. And then over here, there will be some constant. Now, I'm not particularly concerned about this constant over here, so I'm just going to label it constant on the next page. So let me copy this over. And what do I have now at this point? I have f of x, we're bringing the f of x down. I have a times x plus b over 2a quantity squared. Now, that was the perfect square by design, the square that I was completing in completing the square, plus something that's just a constant. And I don't particularly care about its form right now, just that it's a constant. So I'll just put a dot there. Now, from this, I can discern a new form. And simplifying it, I have the form f of x equals a times x minus h, quantity squared, plus k. That is the new form for a quadratic function. And it will allow us to, to read off immediately some of the features of the graph that we want to know. So this is a new form that's more useful in many ways than that ax squared plus bx plus c form. So let's start reading off what we can see. You can immediately see two of the shifts going on here. Let me go ahead and write down what we know about a, just to be complete. We know that if a is greater than 0, this is an up graph, looking like that. We know that if a is less than 0, this is a down parabola, looking like that. We know now that if the absolute value of a is large, then the parabola is going to be narrow. And we know that if the absolute value of a is a small number, close to 0, we know that this will be a wide parabola. So there is the first box of information we know, and that has to do with the coefficient out front a. The rest of this we can recall from our work on functions. This is a horizontal shift. The h in here is a horizontal shift. The k over here is, as you might expect, a vertical shift. Just reminding you of all these things from previous unit. OK, there's the horizontal shift and the vertical shift. Now, to be specific, what exactly is h in terms of those original coefficients? Well, if you see from what we wrote, rewrote up here, that by bringing x plus b over 2a down to x minus h, what we're really saying is that h is equal to minus b over 2a. We'll explore that a bit on the next page. So h is minus b over 2a, and k is whatever that complicated co constant is up here that I'm not going to bother to write out. However, there is an easier way to write out what k is. Notice that when I take h or minus b over 2a and I put it into f, what happens? It goes in here, where there's an x, which makes this first term 0. In other words, k is just f evaluated at this number. So another way to write k is that k is equal to f of h, which can also be written as f of b uh, minus b over 2a. So that's an observation worth making. And then on the next page here, we'll go ahead and write this up in a fashion that we can use. What we want to remember from this page, though, is this form. This is a new form for a quadratic function. So with that new form, I can define a couple of objects. If f of x is equal to, and I'll write it both ways, ax squared plus bx plus c, or if you like, a times x minus h squared plus k, then the vertex, which is for a parabola going up, its lowest point. For a parabola going down, its highest point. The vertex will simply be hk, which, of course, in terms of the original variables, is minus b over 2a and f of minus b over 2a. And that's the way you'll calculate it if you know the first standard form. If you know the second standard form, this is how you'll calculate it. It's the same number in both cases. And why is hk the vertex? Well, remember, when we started out with the f of x equals x squared core quadratic, where was the vertex? It was at 0, 0, the origin. And what has happened to that quadratic? Well, it's been shifted right by h and 
up right or left by H and up or down by K, making the origin now moved to the point HK. So the vertex is down at HK. And so, so here are the two ways of getting the vertex. There is something else we can read off of here. It's sometimes called an axis of symmetry or just the axis of the parabola. It is vertical, as you'll see in the picture. And it is simply wherever the vertex is. Now, the vertical line will pass through the x-coordinate of the vertex, which is h or minus b over 2a. So it'll be the vertical line x equal h, which is the same as minus b over 2a. So that vertical line will be called the axis of the parabola. And let me just show you down here what those pictures might look like. Here is the parabola going up, and here's another picture of the parabola, say over here, going downward. The vertex, in either case, is the nose of the parabola, in this case the lowest case, the lowest point, in that case the, the, the uh, highest point. In fact, let's go ahead and label that. This would be the local minimum point, and here this would be the local maximum point. And then what is the axis in both of these pictures? The vertical axis will be this line that runs through the vertex. So a parabola has an axis, an axis called an axis of symmetry, if you like. It is definitely vertical for us since we're dealing with quadratic functions. And the vertex is given by either one of these expressions. So let's put all of this together and try to produce some results for a given particular quadratic. Let's take an example. Here's f of x equals 2x squared plus 8x plus 5. What I want to do here is find the vertex, the axis, and graph it. Well, let's see. I'm going to show you two different ways to do this. There's a lot of information we, know now, we now know how to get. And sometimes you want to do it one way and sometimes another way. I'll show you both ways and that you lead, they both lead to the same result. In the first solution, the technique I will use is complete the square. Why? Because I'm trying to get it in that form where the h and the k appear immediately. So f of x equals, I'll factor out the 2 from here, as I always do when I'm completing the square. What's left? I have x squared plus 4x. Leave a space and put the constant c out there all by itself. Then inside here, I will add 1 half of, of uh, 4 is 2. So I'll be adding 2 squared here. And then in here, I will be subtracting 2, this coefficient, times whatever I added in here, which is 2 squared. So when that is done, we have 2 times x plus 2. That is by design. And then this is over here. This is 4 times 2 is 8. So 5 minus 8 gives me minus 3. Let me box that in so you can see what it is there. And now, from that, I can immediately read off a couple of things. I see that a is equal to 2, which is greater than 0. So I know the parabola is an upward parabola. I also can read the vertex off. That's the advantage of having it in this form. The vertex becomes immediate, minus 2, minus 3. And once you have the vertex, of course, the axis is also immediate. It is x equal whatever this x value here is, minus 2. So I've got the vertex and the axis. I also know that it is upward. And now I just need to draw the graph, which I can do several ways, one of which I can is to put it in the calculator. But that's really kind of not fair here, because this is really so easy. Let me do this by hand, graph by hand. Let me remind you what the function is in its factored form. f of x equals 2 times x plus 2 squared minus 3. And let me walk through the graphs as we've done before. We'll start out with the x squared function, which we all know looks like this, with its vertex at the origin. We will then move onward by, say, first doing the horizontal shift. 
So we're looking at x plus 2 quantity squared, which means we're shifting it to the left to minus 2 here. So we have the same parabola except it's been shifted over left. Then, bring that down here, we will multiply by the 2. That will cause it to become more narrow. It will still be in the same place, same uh, horizontal position here at minus 2, except we can draw it a little bit more, looking a little more narrow. And so this is the 2 times x plus 2 squared. And then finally, we can get the final version of this, in which we subtract the 3, which is a vertical shift downward. And so we will have here then, if this is x and this is y, and if we're back here at minus 2, we're now shifting downward to minus 3. So that means we have this narrow parabola that's been shifted downwards. And here is the axis at x minus 2 that we've indicated before. And this is the final graph, 2 times x plus 2 squared minus 3. And I got there by taking steps as we did before in previous chapters, in previous units. Now that was solution 1, where I completed the square to get to this form immediately. You don't have to complete the square. So let me show you now solution 2. And let me remind you what the function was. f of x equals 2x squared plus 8x plus 5. Now this time I will not complete the square. I will simply see what I can read off of here from the a, b, and the c. In fact, let me mark those. This is a, this is b, and this is c. Now directly from there, I can read off the following. Again, I see that a is equal to 2, greater than 0, so this is an up parabola. Same thing as before. Now I can compute h, which is minus b over 2a, that's its alternate form. That here is what? Minus 8 over 2 times 2, so that's minus 2. The k likewise is f of minus b over 2a, now that's minus 2, so it's f of minus 2. So that's 2 times minus 2 squared plus 8 times minus 2 plus 5. I can quickly see what that's going to be. This is 2 times 4 is 8, minus 16 plus 5, and so that adds to minus 3. I hope these numbers are looking familiar to you. So having computed A and then H and K, I can immediately write down the vertex. Vertex, of course, is HK, so it's minus 2, minus 3, just as before. The axis, also just as before, is X equal minus 2. And I will leave the graph to you because the graph is the same, of course. And you can put that on your calculator, or you can just draw it directly from here. You know where the vertex and the axis are, after all. So I saved a little bit of time here if I happen to know how to compute h and k using a and b here, where the a, b, and c come from here. So I just wanted to point that out. And I want to point out one more thing before I leave this example is and the point thing I want to point out is that you can do more than what you have here. We have the vertex, we have the axis, we know that it's upward, but suppose we want to graph some other points. Well, we can. And I'll just make that into a note. Now, you will have to decide in a given situation whether you want to do this much work. But if you want to, you can graph other points if desired. For example, you can graph the x-intercepts. Now, what will those be? Let's see. That would be where the quadratic function intercepts the x-axis. In other words, where the quadratic function has zeros. We know how to get those zeros with the quadratic formula. So here we would have b squared minus 4ac, continuing this example. We would have 8 squared minus 4 times 2 times 5. That's 24, and now I'm going to be thinking ahead. I know that b squared minus 4ac is going to be under a square root, and I might want to simplify. So I'm going to see if there are any perfect squares in here. And I do see one. I see that 4 is in there. So I'll write that as 4 times 6. See, these are little refinements we make as we learn more about the mathematics. OK, now I can write down x equals minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. That is minus 8 plus or minus the square root of that 4 times 6 that I just worked out, 
all over 4. And then I simplify down. I have minus 8 plus or minus 2 times the square root of 6, because the square root of 4 here is 2. All over 4, I can simplify a little further. Minus 2 plus or minus 1 half times the square root of 6. Those are the exact answers, but of course, I want to use this information on a graph. So I will now approximate these as minus 0.77 and minus 3.22 on my calculator. Finally, another point I can get if I so desire is the x, or rather the y-intercept. I have the x-intercept. The y-intercept, of course, is always of the form 0, f of 0. It is where we have x equals 0, so we're on the y-axis, and f of 0 is where the y value is on that axis. Well, here it's easy to compute f of 0. f of 0 is going to be 0 plus 0 plus 5, so it's 5. And therefore, 0, 5 is the point on the graph that gives me the y-intercept, and so on. If you can find other ways to get points, fine. You might find that interesting to do, and it may help your graph look a little bit more accurate. All right, let me pull all of this together. I know there was a lot there for quadratics. Here is a summary page, and then I'll come back with an example and show you that. The summary page has, first of all, f of x as a quadratic function in standard form, the first standard form, with the a, b, and c. Then here's the second standard form that we just derived, where we have h and k, the two shifts. Now, that was done by completing the square. And then there was this third form, if you remember, when we looked at the roots or the zeros of the quadratic, we found out that you could write a quadratic this way, as a times two linear factors, which have these zeros in, as they sh show here. Of course, throughout all of this, a is not zero, because if a is zero, you don't have a quadratic, no squared term. All the constants that appear, a, b, c, h, and k, are real numbers. And r1 and r2 stand for the zeros. Now, you remember, they may not be real numbers. The R1 and the R2 could be complex numbers. OK, what can we say here about the graph? The graph's a parabola. It is up if A is positive. It is down if A is negative. How about the vertex? Well, that's HK. Or it can be computed from the A and B as minus B over 2A and then F of that. The axis is X equal H or minus B over 2A. It's just the X value of the vertex, so that's easy. The X-intercepts are, of course, the zeros of the quadratic equation r1, r2, and they're computed with the quadratic formula, as always. And the y-intercept is 0c, because that's the same as 0f of 0. Notice that if x is 0 up here, then f of 0, this first part, drops out, so f of 0 becomes c. So we have a new way of looking at this. So with all of this information, you can produce a reasonably good picture of a graph of a quadratic function. And you can gather this information on your own. So let me pose the problem to you, and you can put all of this together and see what you come up with. Here's the problem I pose. Quadratic, f of x equals x squared plus 4x plus 2. What I want you to do in the break here is graph this function, finding in particular its vertex, its axis of symmetry, its vertical axis of symmetry, the x-intercepts, which are the zeros of the quadratic equation, its y-intercept, and any local minimum point. So with that, give it a little time, and I'll be back in a moment. OK, let's look at this. The function here, the quadratic, is f of x equals x squared plus 4x plus 2. First observation, the easiest one, is that a is equal to 1, which is greater than 0. So this is an up parabola. So I know it looks like that. To compute the vertex, I need the coordinates, the x and y coordinates. I need h, but I don't have this in complete the square form. And I don't need to do that if I remember that h is minus b over 2a. That translates here into minus 4 over 2 times 1. So that's minus 2 for h. And by the way, since this is now an upward parabola, I know that the vertex is also the same thing as the local minimum. So I don't have to look for something different. They are the same. Having h, I now go for k. 
K is F of minus 2. Remember, it's F of minus B over 2A. Here, that's F of minus 2, which in this quadratic is minus 2 squared plus 4 times minus 2 plus 2. That is 4 minus 8 plus 2, which is also minus 2, which is to say the vertex is the point minus 2 minus 2. And of course, the axis, once you have the vertex, the axis is immediate. It is x equals minus 2, the vertical line running through the x value of the vertex. Okay, I've answered part of what I wanted to answer. Uh, let's go ahead and get those intercepts that we promised we would get. I'll do the y-intercept first because it's easy. Y-intercept always has the form 0c or 0 f of 0. In this case, 0c is easy because c is given to me. c is 2. So this is the point 0, 2, and there's my y-intercept. That's easy. As for the x-intercepts, these numbers are the zeros of the quadratic equation. That's when you take the quadratic function and set it equal to 0. To get those, I'll do my usual process. b squared minus 4ac is 4 squared minus 4 times 1 times 2. And in case you're forgetting the parabola here, the uh, quadratic, let me rewrite it. f of x is x squared plus 4x plus 2 here. Let me slip this in on the side. So b squared minus 4ac is that. That is, of course, 8. And that's greater than 0, which, of course, leads me to, to realize that I have two x-intercepts that are real numbers. Then I can find what they are. x is minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. That, in this case, is minus 4 plus or minus the square root of, let's see, I want to put the 8 in there. But I realize that 8 is 4 times 2. And on the bottom, 2 times a is just 2. So this becomes minus 4 plus or minus 2 times the square root of 2 all over 2. That's because the 4, square root of 4 is 2. And I can simplify one bit more. That's minus 2 plus or minus the square root of 2. And if I want exact answers, that's what I have. Of course, I'm going to be looking at a graph, so I'll approximate these with my calculator and get approximately minus 0.58 and approximately minus 3.41, which you can check on your own, and which both of which have been truncated after the second decimal. So with all of this information, I can produce a graph now, which is the point of doing all of this. And here is my graph, which I can really produce by hand. I don't need to rely on my calculator for this. I can produce a pretty good looking graph just by drawing it. All right, let's see what I've got here. I draw one axis this way and another one like this, say. I know that at minus 2, I have the vertical axis of the parabola. I know that the vertex point is down here at minus 2, 2. That's the vertex. I also know it's an upward parabola, so I can indicate that with a little upward direction. And I've also discovered now the x-intercepts and the y-intercepts. So here's the x and the y-axis. The x-intercept, if that's 1, there's an intercept here at about, this is, let's see, mark this over here. This one was approximately, if you recall, minus 0.58. And then if that's 3, the other one was out here. So if this is minus 1 and minus 3 here, the other one was here at approximately minus 3.41. And then where was that y-intercept? It was 0, 2. So here is 2, and I know that that's on the curve. So I have a point here, a point here, a point here, and a point here. So I can produce a graph, if I can draw this reasonably well, that looks something like that. And that's symmetric on either side of this vertical axis. And I've done that all by hand without any need to rely on the calculator because I know where everything is. This now is the graph of f of x equals x squared plus 4x plus 2. And frankly, for parabolic functions, for quadratic functions, you should be able to produce a graph like this very quickly 
having gathered all the information like the vertex, the axis, x-intercepts, and y-intercept, and uh, not rely on a piece of instrumentation. Okay, let me give you the flip side of this, a problem where I give you the graph and ask for the associated quadratic function. Here is a parabola graph, and I've marked a few points on here, so you're going to want to look at that and see what I've marked. And given the information that is in front of you, I want you to write down the quadratic function that is associated with this picture. And I'll be back. Now in this last problem, you were presented with a graph. And from that, you were to try and write down the quadratic function associated with it. The best thing to do in a problem of this sort is to assume one of the standard forms for the quadratic. Now here's the one I'm going to assume here. The quadratic it can be written in these standard forms, but by choosing the right one, you might be able to use the information that is appearing in the picture. f of x equals a times x minus h squared plus k. Here's the form I'm going to assume. And then my job is to find out what a is, h is, and k is. Because if I know those, then I know what the quadratic function is. Well, from the graph, I immediately see the vertex. I immediately see that the vertex is equal to 2 comma 1. If you look at, if you remember the original picture, here it is. This lowest point here was marked. That's 2, 1. That's the vertex. So I know the vertex is 2, 1. But wait, the vertex is also hk, which means I now have h and I now have k. So it probably pays at this point to write down that so far, I now know that f of x is equal to a, that's still unknown, x minus 2 quantity squared plus 1. So now I just have to figure out what a is. And probably, I will want to use the other information that was given to me in the picture. So I will note that from the graph, I see that f of 0 equals 2. If you remember, the graph crossed the y-axis at 2, and f of 0 is that y value. Well, with that in mind, so I can write down the following. I can say, here's f of 0. On the one hand, it's 2, because that was given to me from the graph. On the other hand, I have a formula for f of x right up here. Let's put 0 in for x and see what I get. From up here, I get a times 0 minus 2 quantity squared plus 1. Well, that simplifies nicely. Nicely, 2 is here. What happens over here? I get a times minus 2 squared is 4 plus 1. Well, I can solve that for a. I'll do it on the next page. But it's simple to do. I'll repeat the one I just had. I have 2 equals a times 4 plus 1. Subtract 1 from both sides. I have 1 is equal to a times 4. Divide by 4 and then reverse it because I like it this way. a is equal to 1 fourth. Well, with that in mind, I am done. I now have f of x equals my a is 1 fourth, x minus my h, which was 2, plus my k, which is 1. And now I have found out the equation that went with that picture. So I've done the flip side of the previous problem, which was given the equation, or given the function rather, find the graph. Here, given the graph, I have found the quadratic function corresponding to it. OK. When we come back, we'll start looking at some quadratic function models. Now we're going to take what we know about quadratic functions and their graphs and apply, to them some, apply them to some real world problems. So quadratic functions as mathematical models. So down here on the pad, I've got quadratic functions as mathematical models. And I'm not going to write anything here. I'm going to jump immediately to an example, which I think you need to look at for a bit. And once you've had a chance to think about it, uh, you'll have some time to work on it. And when we come back, I'll show you what I would have done. But let me read this to, through to you.
A projectile is fired from a cliff, which is 500 feet above a lake. And it's fired at a 45 degree angle to the horizontal with an initial, which is sometimes called the muzzle velocity, of 400 feet per second. So this is a kind of ballistics problem. We know the height h of the projectile above the lake is given by this function. So really a great deal of work has been done for us. h of x is minus 32 over 400 squared times x squared plus x plus 500. Where, what does x represent? x represents its, that is to say, the projectile's horizontal distance from the cliff. Now to help you visualize what's happened here a little bit, I've drawn a short sketch before we pose the problems here. Here's the cliff you might imagine here on the left. It's 500 feet tall. Here's the lake right at the base of the cliff. The projectile is shot off at this 45 degree angle. And you get this arc like this, which looks like a parabola, which makes sense given that the function h of x was quadratic. Given that picture and the information on the previous page, part A, graph that h of x out to a horizontal distance of x equals 6,000 feet. B, find the maximum height that the projectile reaches, which in the picture seems to be right about there. And C, at what horizontal distance will it, the projectile, strike the lake, which is marked over here by the splash. So I want to find out the locations of the splash here, the highest point here, and I want to graph the function. Now the graphing, as it turns out, might have to wait until B and C are partially solved. So we'll pro probably try and solve all of these together at once. So go ahead and read this page. And then after a beat, you can go ahead and try this on your own. And I will come back and show you what I did. Now that was a long problem to read, and probably it took you a little while to decide what it was you wanted to do. Here I've written the formula for h, the height of the projectile, at a given x value, which is its horizontal distance from the cliff. And the first thing I'm going to do before I do any other work here is to say minus 32 over 400 squared is too complicated for me. You can use your own common sense about powers of 4, or you can put this in your calculator and simplify this and get this down to minus 1 over 5,000 times x squared plus x plus 500. Now that just makes the work go a little bit easier. OK, now what do I want to do with this in this first part A? Remember, I wanted to graph this. And I wanted to graph this for x in the interval from 0, that's the distance that is right next to the cliff, out to 6,000 feet. So that's the interval I'm interested in. Please note, although I've said it before, that this is a quadratic function here. So we'll use all the information we know about quadratics. Also, you might note that a is less than 0. a is this minus 1 over 5,000 coefficient. And it is less than 0, which means the quadratic is a downward quadratic. OK. Well, I'm going to stop here with a, because although I want to graph this, and I have a, a, an, an x interval here. I'd like to have a y interval also. And it turns out that I can get a y interval from looking at the result of b. So I will leave this for the moment and come back to it. In part b, I wanted to find the vertex because we know, since it's a quadratic and it's an upward quadratic, that the vertex will give me the local maximum point, which is what the problem really asked for. So how will I get the vertex? Well, I need to compute minus b over 2a, which in this case is minus 1 over 2 times that a, which was what? Minus 1 over 5,000. Well, we simplify this. The minuses, of course, cancel each other, so we now have a positive number. The, this is 2 over 5,000, which flipped over, which is what the 1 does, makes this 5,000 over 2. And that is then 2,500. So minus b over 2a is 2,500. So that's the x-coordinate of the vertex. To get the y-coordinate of the vertex, I need to compute the function, which is the h function here, at minus b over 2a, which that's going to be 
h of 2500, and then substituting that in, is minus 1 over 5,000, that's a, times 2500 squared, plus 2500, that's where the x was, plus 500. Now those are big numbers. I have no shame in going to the calculator to simplify this out, even though with a little thought you can probably do some cancellations on your own. So, having looked at the calculator, I have 1,750 feet as the value of h of minus b over 2a. Now what is that? That is the y value of the vertex. In other words, it's the height of the vertex, which we know is a maximum because the curve in this case is a downward parabola. So 1,750 feet is indeed the maximum height. Now that was the question we were asking in part B. So we're pretty happy about that. We've answered that question. Well, now we can go back to A because with the maximum height, I now have an idea of what kind of Y range, Y interval I can use for graphing this. So I can now graph this on, let's see, the interval, the window x 0 to 6,000 by 0 to say, well, something above 1750, say 2,000. Keep it a nice round number. And then the function I'm graphing, let me remind you what it was again. h of x is minus 1 over 5,000 x squared plus x plus 500. And if I put this in my graphing calculator, I get a picture that looks something like this. Since I've got it starting at 0 in both cases, I get both an x and a y axis. And here it crosses at 500. And the picture looks something like this. The maximum point here occurs just below the 2,000 mark. And that's right there. And that's 1,750 feet. So that corresponds to the high point of the parabola. The 500 feet, what's that? Well, that's the height of the cliff, remember? You can imagine that this right here is the cliff. And that this line at the bottom, which is the x-axis, is really the water of the lake. Now I'm finally interested also in that point there, which we will compute in part c. But let me point out one more thing, just since we're here and we've got the picture. Notice that 2,500, x equals 2,500, that's the distance at which it is the projectile is at the height of 1,750 feet. So 2,500 feet away from the cliff is where it reaches its maximum point. Now let's see if we can figure out where it's, the splash occurs here. So to do that, we're asking what question? This is the function, remember, h of x. We're asking where does h of x equal 0? In other words, what is a 0 of h of x? h of x is a quadratic. We know how to get zeros of quadratics, so let's do that. So part C asks the question, when is h of x equal to 0? So we are asking the question, when is minus 1 over 5,000 times x squared plus x plus 500 equal to 0? Well, that's too hard for me. I'm going to multiply through. I'll even write it down. Multiply by minus 5,000. Why? So I can get the x squared coefficient down to 1. So this becomes x squared minus 5,000 x minus 2500000 equals 0. That's 2,500,000 over there if you multiply the 5,000 by the 500. Now the numbers are getting pretty big. It probably does help to have a calculator nearby to simplify some of the work. What are we looking for here? In this quadratic, we are looking for its zeros. So to find its zeros, I will do what I've always done. b squared minus 4ac will be, in this case, minus 5,000 squared minus 4 times 1 times that minus 2,500,000. Big numbers, but same principle. I end up here with 35 million, putting that in my calculator. And then x is equal to minus b plus or minus the square root b squared minus 4ac. I'm looking for the x-intercepts for the zeros. I substitute in, I get 5,000 plus or minus the square root of 35 million. 
hard to remember how big these are, over 2. And then all of this can be very easily simplified using your common sense about numbers that I have uh, zeros at the end, powers of 10. Or, let me continue on here, x equals uh, 2,500 plus or minus 500 square root of 35. Those are exact values, but again, I prefer to have an approximate value that I can actually see on the screen. So I get approximately 5,458.03 feet or minus 458.03 feet. Well, in this problem, minus, if you remember what the picture looks like, minus, here is the graph we had a moment ago here at the bottom, minus is beyond the zero that would be down over here. That's on land, okay? That's inside the cliff, perhaps. So this would be a value that the mathematics leads to and which is correct mathematically but has no physical meaning. So I will take this as the point where I have splash down. So this is splash down or strike the lake, whatever you want to call it. And that happens now at 5,458.0 through feet uh, truncated. So that's how you would attack that problem. It took a bit of work, but then as I said before, these real world problems, these mathematical model problems, this one leading to this nice picture here, like this, this is now at the number we found a moment ago, 5,458.03. Uh, to get a nice picture like this representing a real world problem, to solve it usually takes a bit of effort. Let me pose you another one. This one will only take one page to, to pose. A ship leaves Miami heading due east at a constant speed of five knots. Now, if you don't want to know what a knot is, a knot is one nautical mile per hour. A nautical mile is just a little bit different from a regular mile, but it won't make any difference to us here. So we have a ship that leaves a particular place, which we call Miami, is heading due east at a constant speed of five knots. At 5 p.m., it is <clears throat> five nautical miles due south of a cabin cruiser. And what's the cabin cruiser doing? It is moving south itself at a constant speed of 10 knots. The question we're asking is, at what time of day are the two ships closest? So go ahead and look at this problem. And when I come back, I'll show you how, what I did. Now, this one's a different kind of mathematical model. It's not immediately apparent where the quadratic's going to occur. So, some things that we need to set up if we're going to draw a picture. We need to decide which way we want east and south to go, for example, in our picture. And so, just to keep myself standard with the rest of the world, usually east is to the right and south is downward. So I'll stay with that. Also, I'm going to say I'm going to let time equal t. And time will be measured in hours. And I chose hours because our speeds are given in terms of hours. So because our problem will start with time t equals zero hours, but the actual time of day is 5 p.m. Let me make sure I note that for myself. So t equals zero hours corresponds to 5 p.m. So if I end up with an answer like two hours, then I will know that I need to add that to five to get the actual time of day, which would be 7 p.m. in that case which isn't the right answer, by the way. OK. Let's see what the picture is at time t equals 0. And then on the second half here, I'll give you what the picture might look like for some later time. So we want to see what it is we have to deal with. Now, I took a little time to draw these, so I hope they look clear. First of all, there's the cruiser. 
And it has its velocity, which I'll do with this big thick arrow, of 10 knots per hour. And it is heading south. That's why I've got it going downward. Then down here, I have the ship, which it has its own velocity heading east. So here's the ship going at 5 knots per hour eastward. And then the initial distance between them is the distance between the two dots. So this is the initial distance. This equals 5 nautical miles. That was given to us. So the distance between this dot and this dot in the vertical direction here is 5 nautical miles. Now that's when the problem starts. After the problems have been going a while, after time has moved on past zero, this upper ship has moved down, of course, and this lower ship has moved to the right. So I'm going to use an open dot to indicate where the ship used to be, and then say a closed dot here to indicate where it is now. It still has its velocity going south. It hasn't changed that. And here's where the, I'm sorry that I said ship, I meant to say cruiser. They're both ships, I suppose. This ship started there, and maybe after a while it's over here, still with its forward velocity. This is the ship. I won't write the velocities in over here. I have them back here. So the open dot is where the ship used to be, and this is where the cruiser used to be. And the, these dots are where they currently are. And the problem asks us, what is their distance apart at any given time? So that distance, which I will let s be equal to, that s be equal to the distance between them at any given time. So there's my distance, and that's this line right here. That's the distance I'd like to know. Now, if you think back to what we did in basics, you'll remember that there's something we did there that will be useful here. If you look at what I have here, if I, if I were to extend a line down here, I would have a little right triangle because the, these two directions meet at 90 degrees. And I'd be asking, what's the length of the hypotenuse of that right triangle if I can figure out the lengths of the sides of the right triangle? Well, that sounds like a famous theorem. I'll let you think about what that might be as I move to the other page and redraw this picture larger. Let me also recall, because we're going to be using it, that we had the uniform velocity formula s equal velocity times time. In this case, we're going to be talking about knots per hour. But this is the standard form for the relationship between distance, velocity, and time. All right, here is the picture. This will be, again, at time t greater than 0, Okay, any time t greater than 0. And we have a picture roughly like this. Let's see here. Here was the original position of the cruiser. Here is its present position. And let me just put a little marker down here to indicate that was the original position of the ship. That's actually an open hole. And then over here is the current position of the ship. So let me mark that. This is the ship. And this here is the cruiser. And let's see what kind of distances we know about. Well, first of all, we know that this is a right angle because this is a southerly direction and this is an east direction. And the distance between them here, s, is what we're looking for. Now, what else can we write down here? Well, we know that the initial distance between the ship and the cruiser, which is where the cruiser originally was and where the ship originally was, this is 5 nautical miles. Now, that's a given distance. How far has the cruiser here traveled in the time allotted, which is time t? Well, remember the cruiser had a velocity, v sub c for cruiser, of 10 knots per hour. It has traveled during this time period t hours. So if velocity times time gives me distance, this distance here must be 10 times t. Velocity times time. And that is the distance the cruiser has traveled. So that means this side here, this side, which is the side for the cruiser, 
is going to be a distance of 5, the total distance between them, minus this little bit that the cruiser has traveled, minus 10 times t. And this is a, this side's distance in nautical miles. What about this side over here? Well, the ship moved from here to here in the time period where the velocity of the ship was, remember, 5 knots per hour. So it is simply this side is simply 5 times t, 5 knots per hour for t hours. So now I know the length of these two sides, and I know the letter here, s, that I want to use for the length of the hypotenuse. And I want a relationship between the three of them. I hope you remembered that the theorem involved is the Pythagorean theorem, which we saw back in basics. So by the Pythagorean theorem, let me go ahead and write that out. By the Pythagorean theorem, s squared, which was the hypotenuse, is equal to the side squared, one of them, which is 5 minus 10t squared, plus 5t squared, which is the other one. And then we can simplify the right-hand side, multiplying out this binomial as we've done before. 25 minus 100t plus 100t squared plus, and 5t squared, of course, is 25t squared. Then adding together the two t squared terms, I finally end up with 125t squared minus 100t plus 25. Now that's a nice quadratic. Unfortunately, it equals distance squared, and that may bother you because we actually want distance to be minimized. And to minimize this, of course, we'll be finding a vertex, but that only minimizes distance squared. Is that a problem? As it turns out, it's not. Let me give you a handy fact about distances. Handy fact. S, which is distance, remember, is minimum exactly when it's square. S squared is minimum. Whether you minimize the square or the distance, you will always get the same value. So with that in mind, all I have to do is minimize this particular quadratic. And if you want to give it a new name instead of s squared, you can generically call it f of t if you like. So all I have to do is minimize that. We know how to minimize that now because we're going to be looking at a vertex. So let me go ahead and write that down again. So I'll have it on this page. f of t is 125t squared minus 100t plus 25. And you see here a is greater than 0, which means it is an upward parabola, and so the minimum point is equal to the vertex, which is what I said on the previous page. So in order to find the vertex, I need to find the x coordinate for the vertex first. Actually, the variable here is t, so we'll call it t. t equals minus b over 2a. That's going to be 100 over 2 times 125. With a little effort, that simplifies to 2 fifths of an hour. So I will reach the minimum distance at 2 fifths of an hour after I begin. We began at t equals 0 hour. What I want to do is add this amount of time to my 5 p.m. time, which is when t equals 0 corresponds to. So I want to write this in terms of minutes. So I'm going to take a little bit more work here, 2 fifths of an hour can be written as 2 fifths hour times, and I'm going to multiply by 1 in the form 60 minutes over 1 hour. Because, of course, 60 minutes and 1 hour are the same, so I'm multiplying by 1. But now I can, I'm allowed to change the units. The hours cancel, and then multiplying the 60 through, I get 24, and now I'm in minutes. So the time they meet which was the question after all, is 5.24 p.m. And there you have it. Took a little bit of thinking, but we managed to work that model out. And that's the last of the mathematical models we'll look at for quadratics. When we come back, we'll start looking at higher degree polynomials, which is a whole different ballgame. <laughs>
Thank you.